sometimes take X-ray, uh, take MRIs. But the most important thing is extent of necrosis, are there at risk signs, loss of containment, and how about the stage of the disease? And then various measurements come into place, like the extrusion, the RIMAS index, the lateral calcification, the decentration of the socket and the center of the femoral head. We use the two classifications, catrol and herring, and going through all the cases, yes, there is, a, it's more likely that in the severe cases you have a loss of containment, but you can also have this in, in herring A and even in catrol 2 cases. And there is, of course, an age-related situation, but it's not always age-related. So the major risk factors age, this is very um, clear because the hip needs to remodel and the time for remodeling is the time being during growth. Once the hip is matured, it's done. And the earlier the per phase occurs, the more time is left for remodeling. Extent of necrosis, yes, that is important and of also the involvement of the physis. And this is not realized by all of the people involved in treating Perthes, and that has an impact on the femoral neck and on the width and also at the, to the position of the greater trochanter. Then we look for instability. And once we identify the risk factors, we realize that in various stages we have a quite a, a variation of morphologies and hips that are far away and you can easily Objective measurely, objectively measure with the shanton manner line. Um, you can go with the distance to the metaphysis in, in, in comparison to the, to the normal side and the socket and the femoral head. And then you get various parameters pre-op compared to the healthy side. And once we have identified the case at risk, we start to think about the best treatment. And the severely involved cases, and this is a personal evolution, and, and others have had the same experience, at least in our country. If you really want to relocate the femoral head and you just stay on the femoral side, you have, in many of these cases, to get a huge amount of variation which alters the biomechanics and the function and may also be a factor of later um, disorders. And we went through all this with our patients, so these days we go for concentric reduction, if necessary, even cut the transverse ligament to get a, a deep reduction, and we always reorient the uh, socket first. And this can only be done by a pelvic osteoc osteotomy, you all know Sauter's recommendations with his type of osteotomy. We did this um, a couple of years called the super containment operation, but then we decided to go to a pelvic triple more than 10 years ago. And this just saying non-operative versus operative, that for us is not good enough. So all of our patients go to clinical exam, they go through the gate lab. The data have been published in gate and posture, the first uh, group of patients by Bettina Westhoff and our group. And then we really go for a firm relocation of the femoral head, and if necessary, we add a shortening or rotation and sometimes a little varus. But the varus is going more and more out of our scale. And then we classify how much we get. We objectively measure in the gate lab through the course of disease how the function is impaired and how it comes back to normal. And then, of course, our data on pain, sports, and the range of motion at the end. So up to now, we have close to 140 pelvic osteotomies in unilateral cases, and the inclusion criteria for the quality control is at least one year follow-up and all x-rays available. 
And the first outcomes I like to show you have a follow-up of at least four years. These are today 44 patients. And the, the exclusion criteria, as I said, it's only unilateral and uh, no other musculoskeletal disorder and, of course, complete x-rays. Um, this was mentioned earlier. Since 2000, we perform more and more triple pelvic osteotomies. And this is the, this is the distribution of the um, classification according to Herring and Cattrall. You see the majority are severely involved patients. And if we look at the surgical technique, we had additional procedures which became necessary, three open reductions. Um, and we had eight patients with an additional abduction brace. We had trochanter apophysiodesis, and two patients had additional valgus realignment with femoral neck lengthening. And if we look at the measurements preoperatively, this is the difference to the metaphysis. It came close to normal after one year. If we look at the severely involved, which were 82% nearly, that went down to 8% at follow-up. So this method is quite um, worth to uh, be considered. This is the difference of the centers, which preoperatively are in, in this variation between normal, moderate, and severely involved. And as you see, m the most uh, hips go to normal, and some remain um, in a not perfect position. And if we look at the Rimas migration index, Prior to surgery, prior to surgery, the, the majority is in a more lateral position, and after one year postoperatively, they are much better than before. And just to show you an example, this is a case five years post-op with a perfect function and a perfect uh, spherical head. If we now look to the functional and clinical outcome measurements, it's even more interesting. Um, the uh, patients included have triple only and triple plus femur in uh, 29 cases, and 15 had sorter and femur. And the Stuhlberg classification at the end of disease wasn't that promising as expected. So we. Our aim was to get all patients to a spherical joint, at least Stuhlberg 2. There were some moderate cases, but also 14%, which I call they are not perfect. And if we look at all the cases, the majority of even severely involved cases show favorable outcome, Stuhlberg 2, but not all. And if you then look at those who have been perfectly reduced, where we would expect a perfect spherical remodeling. Only 22 of 38 perfectly reduced hips um, got a perfect result. They had no secondary lateralization or extrusion. They just had a bad remodeling phase. Let me show you the good ones. This is a joint which, uh, in a natural course, would be lost. So it has a triple and um, femoral osteotomy, and at the result you see a shortening, a high riding trochanter, so there are some parameters which are not perfect. If we look at this patient, triple only, you see a huge amount of correction. If you look to the teardrop figure, and at the end of the day, we had a perfect outcome, and you also notice the realignment of the joint during the remodeling phase after more than two years. So the socket remodels also combined with the femoral head. So the take-home message, Perthes needs good attention. And the only hips needing uh, a need for surgery are those which loses containment and centricity or spherical concentric position. And all the others can be managed non-operatively. And we search for the loss of containment with the signs I showed you. And the best timing for surgery is in our hands during early fragmentation stage. Once the fragmentation is more or less done, then it's rather late for a good remodeling. 
and the reorientation, the reorientation of the acetabulum first, so catch the head in our hands, is the best. Sometimes we need open reduction. We may add femoral rotation osteotomy, and we consider in every single case um, the severity of physis involvement and consider apophysiodesis. And even severely involved with this regimen show fav favorable outcome, although not all perfectly reduced hip were perfect at the end. We watch out for all the cases and we'll see how they turn out at the end and then go back to a final analysis uh, to find more parameters which may um, explain this outcome. But in our hands, there is no place for nihilism also, in the very bad cases, we give the hip a chance. Thank you very much.